When I um, started to prepare for this week, I promised myself that this time things would be going to be really different <laughs> because I would hop on the plane with two lectures written in my suitcase. And again, it didn't happen. Uh, which means that I was finishing what I'm about to present to you only yesterday, which has an advantage, because it enables you to pick up on th various themes and thoughts that have already been expressed. It has a disadvantage, is that most of it is quite fresh and new and therefore not as lucid as it might have been if you have thought about it three or four times before. Which is a warning that things might get more complicated than I would like them to be, and certainly than you would like them to be. Um, there is a wonderful connection of sorts with what John was talking about this morning. Um, he was laying out how the question, whose story am I, uh, is a way to get theologically to think about mental health issues like Alzheimer. What I'm about to talk about is to show why the question, whose story am I, is the most fundamental question when it comes to think about disability. Two communities, two kinds of people, uh, the basic idea, of course, comes from Augustine when he contrasted the heavenly, heavenly city with the earthly city in order to explain in the powers in Rome what the difference was between Rome as the earthly city and the church as somehow reflecting the heavenly city. And of course, um, the main underlying point on the idea was that both these cities or communities are characterized by the fact that they have been created on grounds of very, very different foundational stories, uh, as Hannah Arendt coined that term. Um, so much for introduction. Um, what I'm going to do, just to highlight the main sections, what I'm going to do is first I'm going to spend quite a while on picking up a point that Amos introduced yesterday, which is the hermeneutics of, of suspicion. And I'm going to be somewhat critical about the idea of a hermeneutics of suspicion in order to create space for th something that proponents of the hermeneutics of suspicion don't believe is possible, namely to speak in theology's own voice. I think it's important that we try to retain, retrieve, or rediscover, whatever might be the case, uh, the possibility to speak in theology's own voice. Uh, because if we do that, and therefore it's ne it needs to be shown how that might be possible, then it is not difficult to show why it would be the case that when we talk about our community in general, the civil community if you want, we are talking about something very, very different than when we are talking about the community of the church. Um, finally, I want to add one further point to that distinction, which is that I think it is important also to understand that these two communities living and being shaped by the foundational stories of these two communities turns us in very particular people, so that different kinds of communities create different kinds of people. 
and I will try to elucidate why that is important. Um, my interest in thinking about um, the proper voice of theology, theology owns, owns voice, actually dates back from the earlier days of liberation theology, which was the time when I went, entered uh, uh, this field uh, as, a theo- as a, th- a student in theology. Um, we were told that we could not just naively begin to reflect theologically upon the moral and political issues of the day because that would suggest that theological reflection is not driven by a particular position in the world. And that would be very naive to think that you could just do theology without first critically analyzing from which location you are speaking. And this is the kind of claim that Amos was addressing when he was talking about the hermeneutics of suspicion. Um, I want to talk, as I said, more about this hermeneutics of suspicion because uh, for, uh, the, and I want to do so for this reason, um, Christians are a particular kind of people because and insofar as they belong to a particular kind of community. Their community is a community that is shaped by communion. More precisely, the communion of the Eucharist, which means, for now, that it is a community that is grounded in an act of God. What follows from this starting point, and this is the main reason for the entire uh, strategy, what follows for from this starting point with regard to disability and theology is that the decisive question is not how we as members of this community think about people with disabilities. The decisive question is how we think about ourselves within the community of the church as the people of God. At least that is what I'm going to argue. The question of theology and disability is not primarily about claiming theological and ecclesial space to accommodate a particular group of marginalized people. The question is what it means, theologically speaking, what it it means to be the people of God. The issue I want to suggest is therefore not how we think of people with disabilities, nor is it that we ought to direct, redirect our own thinking from how they think about themselves, the truly theological task is to think about what it means to be invited into a community that is constituted by an act of God. Once we start to pursue that question, we will find that, theologically speaking, the distinction between disability and and ability is absolutely meaningless. But that will only become apparent when we turn to theology's own voice and learn to listen what it might have to say. Um, Now, the very point of speaking with theology's own voice, however, has been denied as a sustainable possibility by proponents of a hermeneutics of suspicion. There is no such thing as theology's own voice. And the reason why is this. History of theology is replete with examples of depicting God after our own image and likeness rather than the other way around. When when people start to talk of God according to the proponents of hermeneutics of suspicion, when people start to talk about God, sooner or later, you will find out that what they have to say reflects their own position in the world. 
In other words, they are speaking of themselves rather than of God. As a matter of fact, most of the crit- critical appropriations of theology since the 19th century have, informed, have been informed by this insight. And in recent decades, Latin American liberation theology, black theology, and feminist theology have presented perfect examples of the same. They have shown that in any given period, the image of God showed remarkable similarities with the self-images of those who articulated it. Therefore, when theology raises its voice, it is always a particular historical subject that you are listening to. To suggest that there is such a thing as theology's own voice only betrays a grave lack of historical consciousness. Theology does not have a voice of its own because the voice with which it speaks is always owned by someone. So far, the point of a hermeneutics of suspicion. While I will acknowledge that there is some truth in this, it is only a partial truth and a limited one. The element of truth is that Christian theology necessarily responds It responds to the proclamation of the gospel, which implies that it articulates the response of historically contingent understanding. How could it be otherwise? The mistake, however, is to conclude that theological reflection is therefore necessarily partisan, that it necessarily reflects a vested interest of the group of of people that produced it so that the only possible response is to contrast it with theological reflections produced from other groups. In that conclusion, however, the question of theology's own voice has been changed into a question of appropriation, which means that the question of theology's own voice has been replaced by the question Who is allowed to speak? The inevitable effect of this transformation has been a different mode of theological reflection. It starts from the vested interest in a particular kind of subjectivity claiming its own theological space. Given the sensitivities of our culture in recent times, the result has often been a short-lived span of attention for the latest discovery in suppressed and marginalized subjectivity. Liberation theology has suffered from this. Black theology and feminist theology have suffered from it. And I would rather not see theological reflection on disability going the same road. Against the insights of a suspicion as an epistemological principle, I want to maintain that theology's own voice is not necessarily drowned in the historical particulars of its subject, neither mine or yours nor anybody else's. Theology's own voice is possible to the extent that God is involved in it. It is generated by God who has given himself in Christ and who invites us to participate in his life through the Spirit, so that theology's task is to to seek understanding this divine self-giving. Theology aspires to speak words of God. But it will only find these words if it acknowledges that the objective genitive words of God here presupposes the subjective genitive words of God. With regard to its proper object, what is there to know, theology starts with the question as to its proper subject. Who is our God And what does he do? Theologically speaking, therefore, the particulars of human subjectivity are not decisive if theology is to be possible at all. Of course, human subjectivity necessarily takes shapes as a historically contingent reality that is inactive in all our understanding. But it doesn't follow that, therefore, theology needs to start with historical criticism that unmasked the theological project 
of a particular subject as impure in order to replace it with another subject presupposedly less contaminated by the powers that be. If there is a danger here, historical criticism is not going to prevent it. On the contrary, it tends to privilege a particular historical voice as the true subject of theological reflection. And the problem is not that the ascription of such privilege is necessarily self-justificatory, which it is. The problem is rather that the privilege has been already given, and it has been given once and for all. God has already chosen his privileged people. Christian theology has no credibility whatsoever unless it is rooted in the biblical story according to which God called Israel to be his privileged people in order for him to be their God. Subsequently, the gospel proclaims that the God of Israel has renewed his covenant and graciously sent his son into the world for the salvation of each and every human being. From the perspective of this gospel, the marginalization of particular people is very much the real problem because all of them have already been included in the divine address. But this problem cannot be solved by assigning the problem of marginalization, cannot be solved by assigning these particular people a privileged position. Theological reflection starts with acknowledging that the gospel speaks words of God, and this means that theology is a dangerously presumptuous enterprise if it doesn't recognize that it operates within the realm of grace. Not no fallen and finite human being can possibly apprehend the eternal word of God. Finitum non corpax infinity, as the fathers put it. The finite cannot contain the infinite. They knew, the fathers, they knew that theological conceptions and formulations do not in any definite way capture the truth about God. This doesn't mean, and this is important, this doesn't at all mean that the Christian tradition, what the Christian tradition had said about God is negotiable. It is not, at least not all of it. But it does mean that the truth about God remains God's own. The theological program that is inaugurated by adopting a hermeneutic of suspicion always has a particular characteristic that I think it's important to see. Such a program starts with identifying a means to arrive at a critical position from where to start. And since we cannot naively do so, we need some kind of an instrument of social and historical criticism in order to determine what the proper location to begin is. And as I laid out uh, on Monday briefly, Nancy Iceland's book, The Disabled God, is a perf- perfect example of this strategy. She says, uh, her, she shows that we need to begin from within the experience of the disability rights movement, and this we learn from using the social analysis, provi- analysis provided by the minority group model. Now what this means is that theological reflection in Iceland's approach operates as a second logic that works on disability experience as it has been identified by a particular social theory that operates as its first logic. In other words, her strategy in constructing a theology of disability moves from what I would call from outside in, from outside the domain of the theology into the domain of theology. But inevitable The inevitable result of this strategy is that when the voice of disability rights movement is put center stage, other voices get to become oppressed and suppressed. I should say suppressed. In this particular case, and it is found particularly in the the literature uh, in the last decade, in this particular case, the voices that tell stories about people's struggle and their pain What these stories signal is that there there is a dimension of disability experience that has not much to do with the political struggle for equal rights and social justice that dominates Iceland's approach. As a matter of fact, a major feature um, 
in in the stories told by people with disabilities uh, as uh, no sorry a major fe- feature of the pis- uh, the people with disabilities as the, uh, they appear in her book is that they are strongly motivated to assert their rights and are ready to fight for equal freedom and opportunity. I think that this is probably due to the fact that her book was a theological response to the enactment of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was certainly the moment of glory for the disability rights movement. However, not all people included in the minority group regard this political struggle in the same light. There are those who lack the energy. There are those who are suffering from bodies that hurt or, in f- or who face other issues, issues with a disability beyond the realm of politics. In this connection, the disability studies scholar Tommen Siebers from Michigan State University at Ann Arbor has pointed out that overcoming one's disability through political action means for people lacking physical energy for such activity a reinforcement of their defectiveness. This implies that the experience of pain and distress is taken as a psychic experience caused by social environments but never is acknowledged as a physical experience caused by a disabled body. In this respect, Siebus argues the minority group model reflects a very concept- conventional conception of the able body. The able and healthy body is a body that the subject doesn't feel. It is judged by the ability not only to summon pain, illness and disability, but also to overcome its disadvantages by the force of will. What people with disabilities are left with is the suggestion that to be free from social exclusion and oppression is a question of the will to get involved and get organized. Now, Siebus points out, quite rightly in my view, that this suggestion is not innocent. It not only sends a message of the weakness of will, but secondly, it also denies the representation of all people with disabilities. To make acts of the will essentially in overcoming disability is to espouse a model of political action that is based on the liberal notion of autonomy. It implies that emancipation from exclusion and oppression relies on the intellectual and emotional resources of the individual. In this respect, it clearly cannot represent people with intellectual disabilities, let alone people with profound intellectual disabilities. In short, the claim against theological reflection moving from outside in by following a minority group model as Iceland does is that it privileges the experience of particular people and in the very act of doing so becomes itself charged with the effects of exclusion. Any such move, I would argue therefore, is by its very nature exclusivist. It necessarily elevates the experience of some people over the experience of others. Theological reflection, however, should work the other way around. Not from a particular experience to appropriate Christian beliefs and symbols, but from the word of God as it has been spoken, which indicates, again, why the possibility of theological speech is primarily a gift more than anything else. As I put it in uh, receiving the gift of friendship, explaining to the church who God is for people with disabilities, which is Iceland's mission, in order that the church may become what she calls a community of struggle, I suggest we learn to embody a community of redemption by trying to understand who we are before God. Having cleaned, I hope, the space for the notion of theology own voice, let me now turn to the constructive part of the argument. Adopting this experience of the disability rights movement means adopting a particular story that constitutes it as a community. In this particular case, the disability rights movement has been identified with good sense 
I would say, as the last civil rights movement, which ties it in with the story of the American Republic as it is founded by the Founding Fathers and enacted in the Constitution. It is the story of a people committed to the body politic that they do get a form within which people can assert their equal rights against one another on the grounds of a legal framework that they have accepted as their own. Within this framework, rights and duties are equally distributed to enable citizens in the pursuit of happiness under the condition of equal freedom and justice for all, just to use the language that you all are very familiar with. The point of this exercise is to suggest that community in itself is a nondescript entity. It is, by the way, my impression that currently in the U.S. there is a great deal of talk about community that suggests that being a member of a community is valuable in itself. It doesn't take long to see that this cannot be true. A band of robbers form a community. A group of drug addicts and their dealers form a community, as Peggy's story uh, yesterday showed us. What the value of a community is, therefore, is determined by its purpose. And its purpose, in turn, is identified by the foundational story upon which it is grounded. The community shaped by the foundational story of the United States of America has this identifiable purpose, purpose, which is the pursuit of happiness under the condition of equality of opportunity and equal freedom. Communities are shaped by their their foundational stories then, and that determines their purpose and their structures and their institutions. Now it is quite obvious that whatever may otherwise be the case, the church is a community that must be quite dissimilar from the community of the body politic, American or otherwise. And the main reason, as I pointed out before, is that it is constituted by a very different story. Just a few observations. The gospel story testifies how a group of people was inspired by a self-giving God. The story of the Constitution testifies how a group of people came together to institutionalize self-government. The gospel story testifies how a group of people uh, uh, had the courage to trust the ways of their God in sending them on a new journey without fear of death and captivity. The Constitution story testifies how a group of people enacted a system of checks and balances to counteract the abuse of power to protect them against death and captivity. The Gospel story testifies how a group of people followed whom they believed to be the Son of God and whose charter was to turn one's enemy the other cheek. The Constitution story testifies how a group of people resolved to defend themselves against tyranny and to create their own body politic. This list could be continued for quite a while, and we could make it up for any other nation-state. But all we know, um, because, but this list could be extended for a while, but we happened, we all know what happened with the distinct character of the church. And not only in America, but throughout the Western world and beyond. The story of the foundational story of the gospel got mixed up with stories of the Constitution. The history of Christianity became the history of Christendom and resulted in various degrees of mingling religion and politics everywhere resulting in the claim that we have God on our side. In other words, the history of Christianity is the history of how the church inevitably and invariably fell prey to the temptation of identifying itself, at least in some respects, with other foundational stories, mainly that of the nation state. The point of this exercise is a question, and it seems to me that when I was thinking about it, that it is an important question. And the question is this Could it be the case that the church loses 
its capacity for eliminating stigma and marginalization in its own community to the extent that it identifies itself with other foundational stories. In identifying itself with other stories, the church is identifying itself in some sense with a way of life because that is what other foundational stories embody. Whether they are stories of tribes, of sects, of minorities, of subcultures, of nations, or of nation-states. Ways of life are guided by particular versions of the pursuit of happiness, and these are always supported by certain traits that mark success, as well as other traits that mark failure. To substantiate the force of this question, I want to go back to a point that I made on Monday, but I made it only very briefly. It regards Tom Reynolds' theory of the cult of normalcy as developed in his widely acclaimed book, Vulnerable Community. For those of you who do not know the book, Reynolds writes as a father of a son who has Asperger's and Tourette's syndrome, and whose family has suffered from self-imposed seclusion to protect itself against the painful responses to his son's behaviors. Though this personal dimension is not the main focus of Reynolds' book, it enables the author to set the stage for an analysis of what he names the cult of normalcy. And following the drift of sociological field in, uh, work in the field of disability studies, Reynolds seeks to elucidate how society constructs the meaning of disability as dysfunction and abnormality. And I thought the Foucauldian way in which his analysis proceeds is quite original and interesting. It works roughly as follows. According to Reynolds, quote, normalcy operates as a cultural system of social control. But it does so by feeding upon a fundamental human need, which is the need for recognition. Because human beings need, uh, seek to belong, they tend to try and fit into social patterns of what is considered to be meaningful and valuable. So it's a process that is initiated by a need we all share as human beings, and it is initiated by moves we all make, qua human beings. Normality, he says, is therefore a function of a collective understanding of the good. In my phrasing above, one may say that normality is a function of the pursuit of happiness as it takes shape in society, such that it infuses various domains of our lives with value and meaning. As members of this society where we are accepted, and thus we, are, we find our need of, for recognition fulfilled to the extent that our lives display the traits that our culture regards as meaningful and valuable, the traits that mark success. Similarly, we fail to earn recognition to the extent that our lives display the traits that mark failure in our culture's understanding of the good. Thus, the collective understanding of the good creates the space where we enact what is considered as good and bad among us, which is what then solidifies, solidified, solidifies as the normal. Now, to this, Reynolds add, it is not to say that the cult of normalcy is a seamless entity. It is not, but it does allow difference and dissent, but also they are grounded in the same mechanism of recognition. Difference and dissent do not limit, but rather reinforce the collective understanding of the good. The cult of normalcy, therefore, regulates acceptable forms and degrees of difference and dissent, and in doing so, it protects the normative framework that it supports. The important lesson learned from Foucault in this connection is that this cultural system is not imposed upon anyone by anyone. 
It is a system that operates by means of what Reynolds calls an economy of exchange. Our social interactions within this economy are part of a complex set of practices within which we reciprocate attributions of value and meaning. Our ability to do so depends on whether we are recognized as contributing members of our community. It often occurred to me in, in, in conversations with Americans that there is a particular phrase that comes up as soon as they start about what is important in their lives. And it strikes me because in my own part of the world, I never have heard that phrase. One of the things that makes life important is to be a useful citizen. That alludes to the notion of contributing uh, to the collective understanding of the good. Um, so, But the lesson, uh, uh, as I said, uh, according to Reynolds, is that it is an economy of exchange. It's not an imposition. Um, our social interaction within this economy are part of a complex set of practices, as I said, and our ability to contribute to this economy depends on whether we are recognized as members who contribute. And whether we are so recognized depends, in Reynolds' term, terms on what he names body capital. Body capital is exchange value in the social mechanism that regulate recognition. This account of the economy of exchange explains quite neatly, in my view, why it is to be expected that people with disabilities will lose out. Disabled bodies and minds lose out in this social mechanism of exchange because they are perceived as deficient in body capital. As such, their presence distorts the economy of exchange and produces a sense of disorder, Reynolds says. And consequently, disability is, quote, a social product. The consequence of a fear of disorder and disorientation caused by the, dis by the perception of the deficiency in body capital, end of quote. Now, connecting Reynolds to my earlier, uh, Reynolds' analysis to my earlier point about the difference of communities and our, their foundational stories, one could quite easily argue that the Constitution story has a clear role to play in regulating the economy of exchange, for example, with regard to difference and dissent in the pursuit of happiness. Democratic government controls the extent to which the economy of exchange can let people become marginalized and stigmatized, but at the same time, it also facilitates the free and equal participation in the pursuit of happiness for individual citizens. Having arrived at this point, let me repeat the question that I raised before. Could it be the case that the church loses its capacity for eliminating stigma and marginalization in its own community to the extent that it identifies itself with other foundational stories. And the reason for bringing this question up again here becomes apparent as soon as Reynolds begins to develop his theological reflection. Building upon work, uh, among others, by McIntyre and Hawass, he argues for a view according to which disability is not the exception to the human condition, but it exemplifies the human condition. Human beings are dependent upon others to become their own person, which makes them vulnerable to rejection or exploitation, and therefore to suffering, he says. Now, while this observation seems to reflect his analysis of the economy of exchange, Reynolds sets out, in a sense surprisingly, to show that there is a very different side to vulnerability as well. It can open us to the other, he says, because we are in need. Quote, embracing our own weakness allows us to welcome weakness in another. End of quote. There is, again, the notion of a strange power in weakness then. It opens the possibility of caring for the other and welcome the other's presence. In a word, according to Reynolds, 
it opens the possibility of love. Quote, Fundamentally, love involves welcoming another into the space of mutual vulnerability. Now, this all too brief account of Reynolds' argument is inadequate to highlight the many insights that you, one can learn from it, but it is nonetheless, I think, sufficient to see the point of my earlier question. Because as soon as he reflecting theologically, the recognition of vulnerability leads his reasoning in a quite different direction from where his analysis of the cult of normalcy left him. Instead of being a major risk to lose out in the economy of exchange, vulnerability now appears as a gift. People experience love as a response to their vulnerability that fills their heart with gratitude and hope. Of course, the experience of love as a response to one's vulnerability is the exact opposite of seeing it as a liability in the exchange of body capital. If it is love as a response to vulnerability that ris disrupts the culture of normalcy, as Reynolds has it, then his Foucauldian take on social order cannot have the last word. And indeed, it has not. Breaking the spell of the economy of exchange is possible. Reynolds speaks in this connection of moral trans self-transcendence. Because, he says, we are all members of God's house household, which means, quote, a true economy of exchange based upon grace instead of ability. And he continues, quote, grace manages this household on the basis of an economy of abundance, of giftedness. Such an economy does not traffic in the scarcity of goods and the need for production. It thrives on the plenitude offered by God, end of quote. One cannot help but wonder how the theological account of the economy of grace that creates the possibility of love relates to the earlier social analysis of the power relations that govern the exchange of body capital. The question arises whether there are in fact not two anthropologies at work in Reynolds' book that are controlled by two very different foundational stories. The first, inspired by postmodern theory about the nature of social order, the second, inspired by the gospel of abundant grace. Reynolds argues that human beings are contingent creatures that cannot escape their vulnerability, and it is precisely this vulnerability that, quote, God embraces in Christ entering fully into the frailty of the human condition, even into tragic death, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, end of quote. Sharing the divine self in this way sends a distinct message. God is in solidarity with humanity as its most, at its most fundamental level. And then Reynolds concludes by saying, God works in through and for the vulnerable and broken. The question is how Reynolds' constructive theological argument relates to the preceding social analysis. From how I, I have read it, it appears that God's grace comes in to unlock the power of the economy of exchange that rewards a surplus of body capital but punishes its deficit. And especially in view of the Foucauldian nature of this power, it is not imposed upon anyone by anyone. It is hard to see how that works. If the analysis seeks to show that the cult of normalcy is the result of how social recognition as a fundamental need, need works, then how can theology make a difference? If the answer is the, Paul, the Pauline insight that there is strength in weakness, then it is apparently true that social recognition might work quite differently based on the premise of accepting one's own vulnerability as a gift. If so, Reynolds' theological reflection in fact signals the possibility of love 
that had been foreclosed by his analysis of the economy of exchange. The two foundational stories, one of our democratically regulated capitalist social order, the other of the church that worships Christ as the Son of God, these two stories appear, in fact, to be mutually exclusive. Given this conclusion, it seems certainly possible that the church loses its capacity for eliminating stigma and marginalization in its own community to the extent that it buys into that other foundational story. The question is, why would the church be tempted to do such a thing? It seems to me that that depends on what we mean by church. As an institution, here in this country as elsewhere, the church is quite differently seen as attempting to resist the force of capitalist, capitalist social order, but things may be quite different when we look at it constituency. I suggest, therefore, that apart from looking at different kinds of communities and their foundational stories, we also need to look at the possibility of different kinds of people. And here I come back to what I said in the beginning. The decisive question is in thinking about disability is, in my view, about self-understanding. It is not about how members of the church think about people with disability, but it is how they think about themselves as the people of God. It is about what it means, theologically speaking, to be such a people. And here the, the question is whether both descriptions of human interrelationships uh, here, sorry, here the question is which of both descriptions of human interrelationships we think are actually true. The one that characterizes our being from how it functions in the economy of exchange based on body capital or the one that characterizes our being in view of the belief that, as well on had it, God works in, through, and for the vulnerable and broken. Both these descriptions are claims about the way things are when it comes to your humanity, our humanity, but it seems to me they cannot be both be true at the same time. If we truly believe that God works in, through, and for the vulnerable and the broken, as Reynolds has it, then this must mean that we are not just looking at a moral ideal, something that we should attempt to aspire to. We are speaking of a reality. God works. That there is strength and weakness is likewise not a moral posture that we might or might not have the courage to take, it also is a claim to a reality. There is strength in weakness, not as a way to overcome it, but because recognizing vulnerability opens up the possibility of love, what will bring us the peace with God? As said before, the truly theological task is to think about what it means to be invited into a community that is constituted by an act of God. And here we see the most fundamental difference with all the other foundational stories who are always shaped by the foundational act of a particular group of people. Now this presupposes, however, the, the reasoning that I've led out before you, presupposes that it is possible to speak the voice of theology proper without the strategy of appropriation from outside. That possibility, again, does not exist as a theological construction, some, some kind of an argument that makes the thought of it possible. The task of speaking the word of God is not to be understood idealistically. It is a real possibility because of the fact that God has spoken. The church will be capable of eliminating stigma and marginalization of people with disability, therefore, to the extent that its members see themselves 
in the lights in the light of its foundational story. When they do, they will understand two things. The body of Christ has many members, and they all are similarly similarly related to God's gift, which is how it constitutes them as a people of God. This is the knowledge that completes the argument that, theologically speaking, the distinction between ability and disability, between us and them, in any form of shape, is absolutely meaningless. However, a final word, this knowledge is not something that must be intellectually grasped, for it must be primarily for it must primarily be experienced, or more accurate, it can only be intellectually grasped when it is experienced as a reality. As always is the case in theology, the reality of God's gift precedes human possibility. In this respect, I think what I'm trying to say is close to what Amos has said in his book, Theology and Down Syndrome, about the pneumatological imagination. I refer to that Monday very briefly also. The pneumatological imagination, Young says, enables us to pay attention, quote, to the experience of people with disability so as to discern how the Holy Spirit is present and active beyond our assumptions, end of quote. Now, if the Holy Spirit is present and active beyond our assumptions, then it must be the case that the recognition of vulnerability that opens up the possibility of love is indeed a reality. Thank you.